Started? Um, so, um, I have a couple slides that need the lights dimmed a little bit, so sorry for the darkness. Uh, my name is Warner Losh. I worked for the last three years at Fusion IO, and I now work at Netflix. And I'll be talking to you today about NAND Flash technology, um, understanding um, how it works, and uh, how uh, to get the best performance out of it, hopefully. <coughs> if my slides show, we'll ever start. There we go. Um, so I'll go over the different types of NAND, um, some of the layout that NAND Flash has. Uh, normally I wouldn't bother to go into these low-level details, but it is important to understand if you want to get the best performance out of uh, SSDs and stuff that try to hide all these details, but only do so imperfectly. Stores between one and three bits of data. Usually within a device it's all the same number, although hybrids do exist. Groups of cells are together to form a page. A page, by the way, is the minimum read or write um, unit that you can do when you're addressing the NAND. Uh, <coughs> groups of pages form a block. Now, to write to a page, you can write to it once, but then to write to it again, you have to erase it. And you can't just erase the one page. You have to erase all the pages in that block. Groups of blocks form a plane. Groups of planes are on a chip and groups of chips are in a package. Now that's kind of hard to understand, so I drew a picture that hopefully doesn't suck as much as just the words. So you've got a number of blocks, each block has a number of pages, you have a number of planes um, that are contained within a chip, and then you have a number of chips within a package. This hierarchy is important because it determines how much parallelism you can get. Usually you get more parallelism until you get to this layer, and this is the layer where things start to bottleneck. You can only do one operation per plane, but with multiple planes you can do many operations in parallel. You have multiple chips that act uh, independently, you can do things in parallel as well. Uh, sure, that's actually a uh, later slide. Um, so I'll, I'll get to that, but um, basically there's one to eight chips per, per package, there's one to four planes per chip, there's maybe a few thousand blocks and maybe a few hundred pages, just, and each page is a, f a few K in size, just to give the quick order of magnitude. So I didn't have NAND cells on, on this chart because um, you can store one, two, or three bits of data per cell. And you'd think, oh, I'm storing two bits of data, that's in the same page. Or three bits of data, those are all contiguous bits in the same page. And it turns out that um, NAND storage vendors say, no, that's not really convenient for us. We'd rather have all the bits for the first page and program that, and then all the bits for the second page and modify the programming, and then all the bits in TLC for the third page and modify there. So they wind up mapping to, to different NAND pages. Um, so this, one of the implications of this is that um, some pages read faster than others because, the, um, uh, because of something I'll get to in a second. So how do they store multiple bits in a cell? Because all a NAND cell really is, uh, at the end of the day, is a capacitor. It, uh, you put a certain amount of potential on it, and um, through the magic of uh, NAND flash, you can read it back later. So what they do is when a cell is erased, everything goes into the erase state. So it pushes the charge all negative. When you program, it pushes charge over here. So in, um, no pointer. So um, for SLC, that's easy. You program the bit. If it's one, it stays here. If it's zero, it goes here. But for MLC, you have to program the low page, and it programs it approximately like the top picture here. And then, based on what the second bit is, it'll take the erase state for a one and, and move it here or here, whether it's one, one, or one, zero. And similar um, 
move it here for its uh, zero, 0 or zero, 01 um, for the, the, the second abode. Oh, okay. Uh oh. <laughs> okay, la la la. Just, and just continue. What? Just go out. Just get out of it. Okay. Just get back to your presentation. Yeah. It's and we're back to my presentation. And. Yeah. Just click here. Doesn't work. It worked. I just gave a presentation using. Yeah, I don't, I don't see a dot. Laser pointer? Okay. <laughs> As 12 people are reaching for their packs. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't. Oh. Oh, okay. So, well, if I'd been paying it, if I'd been paying attention, anyway, so, um, like I was saying, when you program multiple bits, you have to program them in multiple stages. So, um, you, uh, so that takes a little extra time. Programming the first bits is fairly fast, but you know, getting them exactly to the right point takes a little bit of nuance. Also, programming the first one, you see there's a big guard band here. This is drawn more or less to scale. So um, it's very easy to put a threshold here and say, is it a zero or a one? You know. Boom. I've got any, any, um, uh, well, any degradation that happens, you know, since all of the charges put in this area, this is a probability distribution, um, since all the charges put in this area, if my threshold's here, this, has to, this charge can move a fair ways before I start making errors in, in determining the cell. So that makes SLC very reliable but not very dense. For MLC, the area is much smaller between the, between the nodes. So it can degrade only a little bit before I start to make um, errors in judgment. And, and for TLC, it's even, it's even crazier. So um, <clears throat> the, the, the cell technology that is used in the NAND really determines a lot of the downstream properties of the NAND. So I've um, summarized in this table what I was uh, talking about. So read speed for SLC is pretty fast and it gets worse the more bits you put in the cell because you have to look at it and study it more closely. Um, the endurance, this is how many times you can write and erase or program and erase um, the NAND cell. You might see if you look in the literature, this is called the number of PE cycles. With SLC, you get a lot, maybe 10, maybe 100K uh, cycles, which is almost forever. Um, but with MLC, maybe five or three or 5K, depending on the technology. And TLC, even worse. So SLC is really good for write workloads that do a, do a lot of writing. TLC is good um, when you need more storage density uh, but don't write so much, um, you know, because its density is pretty good, um, you know, and if you're not writing very much, it doesn't matter that the writes are really slow. So this is a, a, a graph I found on Wikipedia that just talk about um, the trends in NAND since, you know, 2007 to 2013, and most of the process nodes were in the 50, 60 nanometer range here and are in the 10 nanometer range here. It's not really important to know the, the, the sizes, but it is important to know that it's small and getting smaller, and as it's getting smaller, it's getting crappier. <coughs> um, so SLC, a lot of PE cycles, almost no ECC. You need one bit of error correction. One of the things about NAND, that um, I referred to earlier is when we look at each cell, there's a small chance they'll make an error and say, oh, well, this is a one when it was a zero. And that's characterized by um, uh, an error rate. And based on the error rate, the manufacturers say, oh, you need to have this many bits of error correction. So these are, these are successively newer technologies. 
and you see the um, ECC requirements are going up. Rather substantially, 24 bits of ECC is a lot. Um, and even doing that, the, the endurance is much lower. This says 1K, the previous slide said 300. It depends on um, which model of TLC you're looking at. Um, so there are basically three types of errors that get introduced. You know, I said that NAND degrades. Well, if you let it sit for a while, like any capacitor, it'll discharge. So you'll get less charge in the cell. So it'll, it's called left shift error. Um, if you read um, one page, in order to do that, the NAND, um, the NAND controller has to put voltage on all the other pages to suppress their data. And by doing that, it adds just a tiny little bit of charge to them. So if you do a lot of reads, that can degrade. And then as you're cycling through um, the, uh, as you're doing read-write cycles to the NAND, that also causes damage. Charge gets trapped um, because large voltages are applied to erase the prior state or to move it to a new state. Uh, sometimes um, tiny imperfections in the manufacturing process get amplified through stress damage. It, it, uh, and that's, that's what determines the endurance. The more damage that's there, the less well that the cell can store the data, the shorter amount of time the cell can store the data. So NAND pages. Um, NAND pages are the minimum read and write unit for NAND. Uh, in addition to having the power of two data payload, uh, NAND pages also have some out-of-band data. This out-of-band data is used to store ECC information so you, that the data can be corrected. It's used to store sequencing and bad block information so that if there's a log, um, that that can be reconstructed. Usually, um, it's a good practice to program NAND in order. Uh, in MLC and TLC, it's required because of the, I put it in one place and then I move it to another place. You have to program the low pages before you program the high pages. And the NAND vendors have made sure that the page pairs are such that the low pages are low numbered and the high pages are high numbered. Um, and you must erase it before programming which means it's basically write once, uh, which forces you to have a, generally forces you to have a log structure underneath the scenes if you want to do any kind of, have any kind of coherent uh, LBA or logical space. NAND pages in the early days were about 1K. Um, these days they range to 8 or 16K in the current generation of NAND. Um, this size is important because Usually in an SSD, uh, you will have uh, between four and eight, more if you're lucky, chips that are banked together that will determine uh, the, basically the block size for the log that's on the NAND. <laughs> so if you know you have eight chips and they're a generation that's 16K, you multiply eight times 16 and you get hopefully 128K or at least I get 128K when I do that math. Um, and so you know, oh, I want to use my alignment for things at 128K. So uh, understanding the underlying uh, device can be very helpful. There was a question? Yeah, uh, K bits or K bytes? Bytes. <clears throat> yeah, NAND flash usually is sold in, this is a two gigabit part which isn't really helpful. Oh, wait, that's only 512 megabytes. So, um, so NAND blocks are the, the basic unit of a race. There's between 64 and 256 pages in a NAND block. Um, again, newer technology has put more pages in each block uh, to try to take an effective doubling. Older technologies have fewer pages. <coughs> These blocks are much larger than the system level blocks, which are 512 bytes or 4K. 
So multiple system level blocks are placed in an erase block. This, this can get a little confusing, um, but it's the terminology that's, that's used. Uh, erase time can be quite long, so you want to try to avoid that. Uh, one of the things about program and erase, I, why I keep bringing up that the time to do this is a long time, while you're programming a chip, usually you can't do anything else with that chip. So if it takes a millisecond to write out a page, as soon as you've buffered up a page to the hard drive, uh, the SSD that you're uh, writing to, it has to wait a millisecond before it can respond or before it can satisfy a read, some cheat and say, oh yeah, I wrote that, and then assume that they'll get it to flash eventually. Um, but they're the, the chips physically prevent them from doing anything else until that operation is done. Um, Planes um, allow the parallelism. Um, they usually consume one or two bits of address space, and um, usually planes are important for IOPS or read performance uh, because they determine the number of things that can be done in parallel. In some chips, if you're programming on one plane, you can't read on another. In others, you can, you, you, you can still read on the other plane. It, it, it's very vendor specific. Um, and so if you know the vendor of your chips, you can get a, a notion of how your uh, devices will perform. <clears throat> in order to get higher densities, particularly in SSDs, vendors can only make these chips so dense. They can only put so many uh, gigabits on a chip. I think the, the current largest today is um, 256 gigabits on a chip. But in a package, they could stack eight of these up and come up with a two terabyte part. Again, if I've done the multiplying by eight in my head correctly. Um, and this is, uh, you know, this is how they, they get the density. So if you see eight chips on a, an SSD board, if you take it apart, there might actually be 64 they're not eight chips, so there's eight packages. I mean, there might actually be 64 chips going on um, behind the scenes. And in order to uh, figure that out, you need to look at the capacity of the drive and do some math. Um, each chip usually has a chip select uh, to select it for use. Um, this is a holdover from the early uh, design of NAND. Uh, and Sometimes CEs are shared and sometimes they're not. If they're shared, you have lower performance. This is the, probably the only thing, only detail that's really relevant here. So um, I put this timing diagram up. I'm not going to talk about it a whole lot, but you know, basically there's a, a bunch of signals that you have to do um, to interface with NAND. Um, again, you know, T read is the time it takes to get the data. Uh, and uh, the signaling is important if you're interfacing it at the low level. If you're interfacing to SSDs, it doesn't matter so much except for T-read because that will dominate your performance. <clears throat> Here's a picture of a simple um, NAND integration um, that leverages off the memory controller of a micro. There's just one flash chip here. When it's uh, the ready busy signal says when it's done and causes an interrupt and the, you know, these are the signals that are on the prior slide. Um, and this shows the chip select where one chip select goes to the, the, the SRAM and one chip goes to NAND flash. So it's kind of like memory but kind of not because you have to send in all these weird commands before it acts like memory. Um, in more complex systems, um, all this stuff is offloaded, so you can say, uh, do this sequence with these bytes, go do it, and it'll interrupt and tell you when it's done. Um, these systems perform better than, um, you know, than, than the, the more simple systems. And if in a SSD uh, controller, it's even more complicated because um, over here there are multiple banks. Um, so that's kind of a lot to digest about um, uh, about the kind of the basic nuts and bolts of NAND. Hopefully, it, it hasn't been too boring. 
Um, I'm going to shift gears right now and talk about the log structure. I've, I've, I've referred to it a couple times already that says, oh, and because you have to, you can only write once per erase, this usually dictates some kind of log structure. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, now, generally on a log, you have a, um, a group of logical extents. Um, these extents in NAND map to erase blocks. Um, or groups of erase blocks sometimes. Um, new data is appended to the end um, physically, but there's a translation layer that translates the logical to the physical. Uh, this also means as the user's writing data, sometimes they'll write the same block twice, leaving holes in the log, and the log system needs to um, go back and clear out the old data with the holes and write it forward so that it can use the, 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 the space that had been freed up. And this can either be freed up via trim operation or via rewriting the same block. Um, <clears throat> in FreeBSD, um, if you enable trim, when you delete a file, all the blocks with that file go away and are trimmed and allow the uh, log to have more free blocks in its list, which lets it operate more efficiently. Um, but this does generate extra writes um, by the system. Um, these writes are called um, write amplification. This is the factor by which the physical bytes to the or physical writes to the device is higher than the logical to write, writes to the device. Um, I talked about garbage collection. This is just reclaiming the data um, by copy them forward. So I'm going to run through a quick example. I have six extents in this log. Um, each extent holds 10 uh, blocks. The log capacity is 40 LBAs. Um, if you do the math, that means there's two spare um, uh, extents. Um, I've omitted a lot of the metadata that you would need to keep it consistent and reliable. Um, so, um, but this is just uh, to, to, to illustrate briefly uh, the um, write amplification and garbage collection that goes on. So we start out in an um, empty log. That's you know, very self-explanatory. We write some data. The, um, you know, the data is here, um, as you'd expect. Um, we write some more data. This obsoletes this data. It's still here, but the correct copy of, of the data is here. Um, and if there were a power failure, the, some sort of metadata would be needed to know that this is the correct copy and not this. Usually these blocks have a sequence number uh, and it's determined from that. Um, I didn't put that on the slides, like I said, because um, it complicates things. So we do another write. Um, things are still pretty simple. Um, Um, and we try to do another write, but there's not enough space. We want to write um, 20 blocks, but we just have a few blocks here at the end. So what do we do? Well, we know we're invalidating these blocks, and uh, these blocks um, here. So um, we uh, move some of the data forward and invalidate, and this kind of um, complicated uh, chart shows that. We're moving this data and this data forward, and we're invalidating this area. Um, and then since this block and this block are now invalid, this is the start of the log. <coughs> and then we actually write the data, and you know, we have a situation where the log starts here, goes here, and here, and here, and then loops back to the front. Um, these red items are um, blocks that have been written twice. Uh, so that caused a little bit of write amplification for this example, which is basically over at this point. Um, you know, we had 72 physical writes, but only 65 user writes. So that's about a 10% overhead. So it'd be a write amplification of 1.1. Um, all this moving stuff about in the logs will be important 
if you're trying to optimize uh, SSD performance. So, so when there's high write amplification, what, what will you see if you're using SSDs? Well, the, the biggest thing you'll see is additional latency. Um, as you do, uh, if there are additional writes going on behind the scenes, this makes the drive busy. If the drive's busy, it can't answer your request as quickly as it could if it wasn't busy. Um, it reduces the endurance of your drive. If you're doing extra writes to the drive, those aren't useful writes to the user. So that means that uh, the drive won't last as long. Um, and it also leads to lower bandwidth. All of these kind of make sense. If you're writing to the disk, keeping the device busy, you won't be able to read the, the data out. So what are some things you can do to, to try to avoid write amplification, to try to second guess the FTLs that exist in the SSDs? One way to do this is to write uh, large blocks of data. If you write large blocks of data, then the number of holes in the data will be smaller. Um, the uh, FTL may do run length encoding, so it can be more efficient. And the blocks of data are more likely to line up better to an entire extent of data rather than just you know, being pieces here and there. Um, the other thing you can do is you can enable trim on the device. Uh, in FreeBSD, what that does with UFS is when the device, or it's when the file system deletes a file, it tells the device, oh, I don't need these blocks anymore. That puts the blocks into the free pool um, right away without having to read the contents and write them forward. This is a much more efficient way to tell the drive you're done with the data than to rewrite the data or to um, just keep writing data. If you don't tell the drive, hey, trim this data, it will need to copy it forward. So uh, that reduces write amplification, increases your endurance on your SSDs, and generally improves performance. Now, there are some SSDs where trims take a long time, and enabling trims, if you're deleting a lot of small files, sometimes can cause an issue. You have to try it out uh, and see which performs better. But generally speaking, most of the time, enabling trims on SSDs is, is the way to go. It's certainly the place to start when you're doing things. Um, in FreeBSD, things like GSTAT um, minus D will tell you um, any discards um, that are going to the disk. In FreeBSD, uh, bio discard maps to trim at the lowest level or one of the other uh, trim-like primitives in SCSI and you can monitor how much time it's taking. If your workload is causing a high number of trims and a high percentage of the drive to be used by the trims, then that might suggest you would benefit from disabling trims. Um, another thing to do, if you can't do large writes, try to avoid checkerboarding. And by that I mean um, writing uh, one block and then one block and then uh, one block from different areas because that leads to uh, a sparser collection of blocks in each extent, which makes write amplification higher. If you don't have, if you have a uniformly distributed set of holes in the extents that you want to garbage collect, then you have to garbage collect more blocks to get one, or more extents to get one extent worth of data. Um, and as free space gets slow, this can be, you know, a 10 or a, a 20x factor because it tends to go as one over the free space in terms of uh, in, a, in a purely random workload. This is based on like, the order that you did the writes. That's based on the order you did the writes, yes. If I wrote, if that was a fact that I wrote block A, B, C, D, E, you don't want me to, to obsolete blocks B, E, and F, and then I write the LPAs that are. That's correct. That's correct. They, you, a, B, C, D could be originally sequential. It's the making the holes in between, that's, that's the problem. So if you're writing a file system, um, looping through the LBA space is much better than trying to, to be smart and say, oh, I'm going to conserve this. I know I can go back and reclaim this because I freed it earlier. But also, it sounds like it, it's not so important that you loop through the LBA space, but that you don't obsolete recently written. You obsolete a big chunk of recently written things, or they go over it all at the same time? 
Yes, that's a more nuanced understanding of the thing. Looping through is one way to do this. That's another way to do that. So, um, the other thing you can try to do is if you have cooperation from your drive vendor, you can say, hey, how big are the extents under the covers? And they'll tell you. And you can um, set some kind of log-based uh, file system uh, up to take advantage of that. <clears throat> okay, so um, the flash translation layer in each of these drives um, does a number of things. Um, it will do uh, wear leveling and error correction. Um, sometimes it'll do error avoidance um, and error recovery. Um, error avoidance is not doing things that it'll know will generate an error later. Um, an error recovery is, oh, I determined an error and I recovered from that. And sometimes the recovery is just to, oh, we'll go ahead and erase and program the block again. And sometimes it's, oh, I need to um, get rid of the, the block. Um, and there's also some fit things you can do with the physics of NAND that um, make the erase or the program less harsh on the, on the um, underlying cells. So the damage each time you do that is a little less. But to do that, you have to sacrifice some performance. One of the reasons that the endurance is so low is they were trying to make write as fast as possible. And when write is as fast as possible, you have to hit it with a big hammer. And if you hit something with a big hammer quickly, it does more damage than if you hit it with a small hammer slowly. So the, the NAND management in the drives takes care of all of these details. Um, generally, you don't have to worry about that unless you're operating at the lowest layer. But I wanted to, um, to include that in this talk to give a, a, a flavor for some of the things that are going on behind the scenes. You might think that your SSD is perfect and great. But in reality, you know, NAND flash is crap and getting crappier as far as errors and endurance go. So um, the, the, the drives have to become more and more sophisticated and work harder um, to get the higher densities to give you the same performance as yesterday. <clears throat> so in addition to the recovering free space aspect of garbage collection that I talked about, um, some NAND systems can trigger garbage collection at times that seem completely random. Um, Usually this is triggered when a read happens uh, and the um, detected error rate is too high. When that happens, the, the management system of the drive goes, oh, I can recover the data now, but I need to be able to recover the data in a few hours or a few days or a few weeks. Um, and I don't think I can guarantee that anymore. So to deal with that, it copies the data forward, increasing write amplification. And this happens completely transparently. So one thing you might notice in your SSDs, um, if you're um, serving uh, 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 some workload, you might notice everything's fine, everything's fine. You know, I wrote all my new content a couple days ago. And uh, I'm serving, say, I don't know, to pick a random Netflix example <clears throat> video um, out of the uh, box. Everything will be fine. And then all of a sudden, the latency will spike. Well, what's happening? in the SSDs is um, each time you read them, it's causing a little bit of damage to the cells or a little bit of um, perturbation in the cells so that the data that's in them is degrading. And once you read them often enough, the data rates get high enough that the management software goes, whoa, I'm worried about this data. I need to copy it forward. Well, copy it forward is writing to the array. Writing to the array affects performance. Um, so that's one thing that can just suddenly happen. We've observed this in the uh, Open Connect appliance that Netflix has. Um, for those of you that have missed uh, Scott's excellent talk on it, uh, briefly, it's an appliance that um, Netflix puts a bunch of videos, House of Cards, Orange is the New Black, those kinds of things on, and streams them out over the internet for, I don't know, maybe a third of the internet traffic, according to published sources. Um, and as we do this, some of the popular content has to refresh. And we, we notice degradations in the read latencies. Um, and there may be other events that are triggering this as well. If you've got a chip that goes bad, 
Um, most SSDs have a second layer of redundancy that can recover from that. Uh, and that has to kick in. And when one chip goes bad, basically that means rewriting the entire drive to um, handle all of the blocks that are in that one chip um, for that drive. And while that process is going on, and it can take in half an hour or an hour or several hours, the performance of the, the drive is degraded. So these are invisible things that the NAND management layer is taking care of behind the scenes to keep your data safe and secure, but that you may notice um, an impact of performance. And um, some SSD vendors will, or uh, solid state um, PCI card vendors will give you some insight into what's going on in the drive. Um, others won't. Usually SSD vendors say, hmm, forget it. Sometimes they'll provide you with some smart data that tells you that a high write amplification is going on, but not why or what you can do about it. Um, some of the PCI card vendors will give you very specific details that this chip now failed and three chips have failed in this array. It really depends on, on who your vendor for storage is, what information that you can get out of it is. Um, I've been talking mostly about in this talk about managed devices, um, devices that have a flash translation layer. They prevent a logical interface to the host, and um, they do all the translation. In an embedded environment, in your phone, in um, a little uh, network appliance, all of that is done by host software rather than hidden in the, the NAND hardware. So some examples of managed devices are SSDs and thumb drives and SD cards and um, NVMe, uh, the new uh, flash standard. Um, and some raw flash parts will do this, but typically um, uh, the raw flash parts provide an unmanaged interface. So um, raw NAND um, has an unmanaged interface. You have to deal with the bad blocks and the read retries and the ECC and dealing with all of that and coordinating that within the system so that you have a reliable uh, file store or a reliable data store. <coughs> There's some hybrid parts on the market that'll do parts of these. Um, the most common is parts that'll automatically do the ECC uh, generation and correction for you uh, so that the host doesn't have to get involved. ECC is typically the most expensive operation to do in software um, once you get the data moved because you have to look at the data again and do some complex calculations um, over Golius fields and stuff and that's get rather computationally involved. Having that done in hardware is a, a great advantage. Um, <clears throat> so in FreeBSD, um, as a general rule, CAM is used for SSDs, for disks or USB drives. Um, there are some custom drivers for like the LSI uh, RAID card um, and others that you can connect uh, SSDs to. And we also have the MMC stack, or the MMC SD stack, which uh, if you've got an SD card that plugs into an SD controller, uh, gets used in FreeBSD. Um, these are all managed devices, and um, you have a block layer in FreeBSD. If you're using these, um, you don't need to generally worry about that unless you need a specific performance level. And then um, you need to look at some of the things I said earlier in my talk to um, deal with that. Um, some of the features that help flash in FreeBSD is trim support. Um, you can use a large block size in UFS. You could use ZFS because it is a um, basically a log structured store uh, and matches well with flash. One of the other things that FreeBSD uh, currently has is uh, direct dispatch, uh, which um, allows you to go from a few thousand IOPS a second to a few hundred thousand, or you were saying a million yes, a couple days ago, up to a million IOPS, which really helps with um, database uh, transactions. Um, when Fusion IO had its FreeBSD driver, we would get maybe a quarter or a third of the IOPS out of the cards simply from the bottleneck in GEOM that uh, Alexander fixed. 
So um, typically, SSDs have become very good at emulating disks, um, but you still need to be a little bit careful about how you write to them to keep them in their happy zone. <clears throat> so um, some of the things you can do with FreeBSD to get good performance out of SSDs, or at least a good place to start your performance tuning at, um, is to use uh, align partitions to large boundaries, um, 64K, 128K, 1 meg if possible. Um, ensure that the stripe sizes um, uh, are similarly sized for RAID, again, so that you're, you're, you're trying very hard to align to the blocks uh, that the SSDs work best at. Um, if you're optimizing for particular drives, if you have a thousand machines that have a particular, you know, seven of a particular SSD in them, you might want to ask your vendor what the optimal settings are because trying to find them through trial and error might take a little while. They'll give you probably a range, but the range will be much smaller and easier to test than if you try to do this from scratch. Um, use the, 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 the block sizes for UFS and ZFS and um, test a variety of workloads uh, or, or test a variety of settings for your specific workload to find what works best. Unfortunately, in this area, there's no you know, one size fits all. I can't say, oh, yeah, just do this and it'll always be fast. Well, I can say start here and it'll probably be fast, but you have to tune for your own workload. Um, one of the tuning experiences we had at Netflix is we went from a 64K alignment to 128K alignment. And we thought, hey, this will improve performance. Things are better aligned. And the performance either got worse or wasn't any better. And, and that was un unexpected. So we went back to the 64K alignment and performance um, where it got worse, returned to the prior levels. And where it didn't get better, it didn't get worse. So um, you have to try a variety of settings sometimes to come up with the optimal uh, up settings. So. Um, <coughs> So one of the things that can cause big performance degradations in uh, SSDs, um, reads and writes interact. If you have a mostly read workload, you're, you're probably OK. If you have a mostly write workload, you're probably OK. You probably won't see any performance hit. If you start to mix these, uh, it becomes very, very quickly that if you want to have good read performance, even a low level of writes, 10 or 15 percent uh, write workload, can um, affect your read workload by an order of magnitude. Um, lots of reads also can trigger garbage collection in the NAND management layer. So if you can manage your data so that it's refreshed often enough that it doesn't read so much that it causes a high level of garbage collection, your performance will be better. Um, and again, misaligned or checkerboarding of data taxes the, the flash translation layer, which usually translates to poorer performance. If you want to try unmanaged NAND in FreeBSD, um, I have a couple of pointers here. Um, my talk earlier this morning went into this in quite a bit more detail. Um, it's probably best characterized as preliminary and experimental. Um, if you are wanting to deploy to an embedded appliance, though, uh, it's something to play with and uh, try to improve. And if you want details on that, I guess um, you can see me after the talk. Um, so does anybody have any questions, or have I lulled everybody into a nice set of sleepiness before lunch? Yes? Right, so the, the question is, um, do I need to write in large chunks, or if I'm writing in small chunks, it's all appended anyway, so why does it matter? And you would have to have a, that's, exact, that's one of the inefficiencies 
that I was alluding to. If you write a bunch of small chunks, then it can't coalesce ranges. Um, if it has a direct map uh, for LBA to physical, it doesn't matter. But if it has some kind of tables um, that tries to coalesce ranges, which, um, or a try that, that, that can optimize lookup times and optimize size, then it can matter a great deal. And it really depends on which SSD uh, what you get. Sometimes the inefficiency isn't from, oh, it creates a large hash table. It's all extents are 32K. And if you write in 4K chunks, we read 32K, we replace the 4K you just wrote, and we write that 32K back out. How can we figure out what that chunk size is? <clears throat> is that, that's basically the uh, page size? Um, that's basically the page size, but not always the page size. Because in SSDs, you can have multiple chips together that coalesce to form one page. So if you have eight chips of 8K or eight chips of 16K, that could be a 128K page size. Um, on one vendor, but other vendors uh, slice it up differently, and you still have the same eight chips, but it's only a 16K uh, chunk size. It, it really depends on the firmware in the controllers um, to exactly how that gets laid out to disk and how you can take advantage of it. Um, the advice, write large, is, is based primarily on um, kind of a lowest common denominator if you write a larger chunk, then on the first type of vendor, you'd get one entry. And on the second type of vendor, you'd get four entries. But it would still be very efficient. Um, you would still only write the data once. If you're writing a bunch of small stuff, then the first vendor might only write one copy. But the second vendor might write effectively eight copies of it, because it has to do the copy forward to, to, to keep the 32K effective block size to have their map be to stay in whatever tiny amount of RAM they have in their controller. Mm -hmm. Right, and usually you, the, I think the, the bottom line answer is you ask your drive vendor to tell you what that is. I don't believe there's a standardized thing in the drives that you can ask for to get that data. If there is, please let me know. I would love to know. Been there, done that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Both sides. <laughs> so uh, you were mentioning, you know, uh, trying to align file system stuff, uh, sizes to uh, to underlying sizes. If by some miracle your your SSD vendor actually tells you uh, the sizes that they use, uh, do you think alignment is more important? Is do you think more important to be aligned versus the let me think about that a second. The question is, um, if you can get the SSD vendor to tell you what the block size is, whether it's the program block size or the um, erase block size, which is it more important to be aligned to, the program block size or the erase block size? Um, I would think... I think the answer is going to be it depends. I think the program block size will be a sufficient level of granularity. Um, but the program block size may be 128K, where the erase block size might be 4 gig. And so aligning things on a 4 gig boundary um, might be difficult. I'm doing math in my head here. I might be off one way or the other by a factor of two. Um, so. Um, you know, so that, that would present a problem. You don't necessarily want to align and do things in two gig chunks because that's inefficient. But you might want to align to a two gig chunk but do things in a 128K chunk yeah. um, to, to, to kind of try to get the best of yeah, both worlds. Kind of what we're doing. We're kind of trying to, you know, start partitioning. <coughs> right, and that's, that's usually a good trade off because the alignment helps the FTL um, layer, do the, the, the translation layer, and then the large chunk size avoids the fragmentation that, that, that um, causes problems. Any other questions? 
Okay, I guess uh, I'll end it there. Thank you so much for your time and attention.